I want to just touch on uh, the approval earlier this year of blenitumumab for MRD positive patients. I was frankly surprised that the uh, FDA approved uh, blenitumumab in that setting. A number of years ago, they said MRD is an endpoint they weren't going to consider. In fact, the study that showed the promising results was actually done in Europe because uh, it wasn't felt that that would be accepted here in the U.S. But you know, with blenitumumab, I mean, they saw an outstanding response rate. Eighty percent of patients converted from MRT positivity to, to uh, a negativity. Uh, so it was quite, quite uh, impressive data. And, and the drug is, I think, tolerated better in that setting uh, as well. Um, so how are you using blenitumumab in this setting? The hardest thing for me is identifying that MRD positive patient when they're still MRD positive, and that's why I mentioned that I've increased the the my duration of monitoring for MRD in my adult patients to try and pick up on these relapses. When that paper first came out, the first first thing I did actually was was uh, not, I shouldn't say the first thing, but not not long after I emailed Nicola Gokpache and I and I emailed Monica Brueggemann and I said, "How are you? How are you finding these patients? How often are you monitoring for MRD?" using allele-specific PCR, because uh, I want to find them when they're MRD positive, too. I want to find them before I see a fulminant relapse. And, and I was surprised to hear that there is uh, monitoring that extends beyond the maintenance phase, because in my practice, that wasn't something that I was necessarily routinely doing. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, that was the first thing that, that came to mind, is how do I identify the patients to take this approach? I do suspect and we're gonna see data emerging with time, that the patient who is MRD positive after some very intensive course of therapy is very, very different. Meaning that patient I would actually call, if there were a term I could use, MRD refractory, from the patient with MRD relapse. And I suspect the MRD relapse patient is going to do better than the MRD refractory patient. And I only say that having tried giving, blin giving blinatumumab in that setting for some of my patients in the past, and, and not seeing quite as pronounced activity. So there is data for, from Dr. Cook from the German study where they've looked at using Blen for uh, CR1 MRD positive, CR2, CR3, and the best results are CR1 versus 2 versus 3. Uh, yeah, I think the response rate is higher, and then when you follow patients out, the survival is better when it's in CR1 versus 2 versus 3. Which is fascinating to think about. Uh, you, you have to wonder why. Is, is that something about their T cells Probab that's impacted probably. by sequential therapies probably. or is there something else I think going probably on? it's a combination of the both two. I think, it, I think the, um, you know, just not kind of the effect, not, especially the immunotherapeutics approach, there's so many variable parts which is in the chemotherapy, we only have to think about the tumors and then the sensitivity of the tumors to chemotherapy. Now with the immunotherapy, it's not just all about the tumors, it's actually what's happening to the immune cells because we're active in the immune cells to kill the tumor cells. So you know, do we have to be a little bit more, I think have to think a little bit broadly that where, what is really the best setting to use and when the, when the T cells are healthiest, healthier, so there may be less treated patients and the disease also may be kind of the responsiveness may also differ as well to the T cells kind of at the same time. So I think that is kind of encouraging, but a lot of the immunotherapeutic drugs, they're you know, the better response CR1 to CR2 and CR3, which I guess in a way intuitively you can argue it's not too surprising. Of course, all these drugs are gonna do better in the early, kind of earlier lines of a setting, the later lines of a setting. I don't think we have a clear answer to why, but we can speculate that that may be. But it argues, and I think strongly, that this should be kind of the uh, move to the front, like earlier lines of a setting. Um, to be used. What do you think, uh, getting a little bit off topic here, about uh, Ivana's data looking at a brutinib, I'm sorry, at looking at uh, blenitumumab with a PD-1? Well, there's, this, there's, an, there's an abstract that's presented at ASH where I think it's the people from Hopkins have, uh, have added first a checkpoint, a PD-1 inhibitor. So it's a phase one study. First, they're adding P, uh, PD-1, and the next phase is to add ipilimumab to the study. And I think, at least in the abstract, there were eight patients treated and 80% response CR rate. Which is correct. Incredible. So this is, I mean, it's only eight patients, so 
These were MRD positive patients? No, these were relapsed refractory patients. Yeah, relapsed refractory patients. So PD-1 plus ipilimumab? Well, the first, I think they fit uh, from the abstract, it looks like, the, because they didn't go to the actual oral presentation. Uh, they've completed adding the checkpoint inhibitor, and I think the next cohort is going to add on the ipilimumab. They may have more toxicity I was going to say, on. with 80%, I'm not sure I well, want to add Well, that's, <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> Take what you have, expand the number of patients, and see what you get. But it is an incredible result. And, uh, and, and getting back to what you were saying about T-cell exhaustion uh, and uh, how that may be influenced by the number of prior lines of therapy, perhaps. Uh, and, and that may be something that we're overcoming with, with, the, with this addition. I'm not sure. I'm just really excited to see it. I mean, there may be another place where you look at the new novel therapies, where you look at uh, BLIN versus CAR T-cells. So maybe earlier on you would use BLIN Later on, you may want to you, you may want to use CAR T cells to get a better response because I mean CAR T cells with MRD disease has a very good response rate. Mm -hmm. I think that's also <laughs> extraordinarily controversial. It depends no, on who you ask. Well, if you ask me, I say yes, that's a great idea. But I think some of our pediatric colleagues may make uh, have have expressed some concern about CD19 loss no. and and how that may be influenced by uh, blenitumumab. I think that's a very important point to, to raise, though, and I have my own opinions about kind of using kind of these type of an agencies, uh, depending on what is available in the CAR T cell therapy, and at least in adult ALA, there's not approved uh, uh, product available at, uh, up to the age of 25. It's hard to deny an effective therapy kind of in anticipation of still an investigation agent. But at the same time, I don't know whether in if they're refractory to blenitumumab or CD19 directed therapy, they are going to retain the CD19, and you know whether it's going to be really bad or not. I don't, you know, we don't know, but I don't think so. But if they do become CD19 negative, that means they responded very well to the therapy, and therefore, be, you know, who knows, they may not have a really benefit from the CAR T, and maybe you should kind of the, uh, pursue another approach. So, for that matter, I think it's hard to argue not to give blenitumumab, but you know, sometimes it, it, I don't, just don't think we enough we understand enough. Sometimes I think actually getting some CD19 uh, directed therapy with B cell depletion before may actually help the CAR T cell therapy to work better. You actually may debulk them a little bit before CAR T cells go in, and there's an antigen kind of competition. But T cells may expand slowly because the blenitumumab based binding or another CD19. Therefore, you may get a slower kinetics of T cell expansion and less toxicity. And then maybe kind of there's a good of a response. I mean, exactly, and this is always this is always speculate. Exactly, right? yeah, but also in future, if, if you do use blood and they lose their CD19, you're going to have CD22 CAR T cells available. So and hopefully, yeah, and hopefully that also pans out. But it does bring up the the need for randomized trials. Yep. I think yeah. I think that's really what the, yep. you know the take home point is. A lot of this is retrospective, correct? Uh, and there's so there's always going to be some hand waving that's part of that, um, but. Uh, we need to, I mean, because it, it, to, to your point, it could be that you want to treat with blenitumumab to ferret out your, meaning if you believe that it's a pre-existing process, to ferret out your 19 negative clones because now you've just saved some umpty thousand, thousands of dollars and not expose that patient to CAR-T knowing that they would have uh, emerged with a 19 negative relapse in, um, in the same context. So I also think when we're using blen for MRD positive disease, uh, most patients, so if you're worried that a patient's going not to respond to the blend, you can do a bone marrow at around day 14, day 15, and you'll know because by that time, most, of, uh, most patients will have already become negative, and also you can make sure that the patient isn't progressing through the blend uh, so you don't lose, uh, lose anything. 